are dismissed. Kindergarten through second grade. Give our kids a hand this morning. Like you mean it. Now, of course, here at Grace, you know, we have, uh, during the worship service, we've got nursery for you if you'd like to use that. Also, we have children's church at this time. But I'd like to occasionally remind you that all children are welcome here in the sanctuary. Amen, church? Listen, how many of you would like for your family or for you to be blessed? Raise your hand. Okay, some of you don't want to be blessed. That's cool. I don't understand that. Okay, not sure what that's about. Of course you do. We would all love to see our families to be blessed. But when you look at families today, is that the word that you think of? Blessed? Maybe you think of stressed? Struggle? Barely getting by? And there's a, listen, admittedly, there's a lot more struggles today, maybe, than in, in years past. We've, uh, different things. There's so many blended families, right? And, uh, uh, which can be a blessing. But when you're raising your kids and raising her kids, and we're raising our kids, and then there's exes, that can cause a lot of stress, right? Or maybe uh, even a single parent, single mom, you're the only one to, to carry the load, and that can be overwhelming at times. There's some ladies in here, you're married, but you're functioning as a single mom because, let's be honest, you're the glue that holds that family together and, and uh, it can be overwhelming at times. So what we're going to do is we're going to let God's Word speak to us this morning and we're going to be, uh, if you're in your, uh, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5, but when uh, Jesus taught on the Beatitudes and we're going to take a couple of these and we're going to apply them specifically to the family. Now, maybe you're here this morning, like all our guys back there in the corner. What's up, guys? Maybe you're here this morning. Don't look at them. Amen. Listen, maybe <laughs> I'm never coming back. Listen, maybe you don't have a family yet. Listen, it's good now to understand what you need to know for when those blessings come later in life. Maybe you're at the stage right now where your children have already grown up and flown the coop and left home. Listen, every principle that we're going to talk about this morning applies perfectly to us as individuals, as, a, as families, and as a church. But we're going to zero in and we're going to focus this morning on the family. And the reason why we're calling this series Bless This Mess is because we have to acknowledge that none of us are perfect. Amen? Amen. Hopefully we're being perfected by the power of God, but none of us are perfect. And if you, <laughs> right? And all of our homes, all of our families sometimes are a little bit of a mess. A little bit of a mess. So our main verse this morning, look at Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse number 6. Matthew 5, verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matter of fact, let's say that together on the count of three. One, two, three. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Listen, uh, many homes today are not filled with that which matters most, but are searching and striving for something to bring meaning because we're filling our lives with all these things that don't really matter and we're not hungering for righteousness. Let me ask you a question. This kind of bring it home for you. What in your home, what were you hungering for this week? Was it righteousness in your life, in your dorm in your family, in your apartment. What were you hungering for this week? Let me just make, I mean, the last seven days, what would you say that you were pursuing? Really, I mean, pursuing. Some of you, if you're being honest, you're like, I was pursuing quitting time all week and ready for the weekend to get here so I could relax. And so you probably wouldn't say it, but some of you are probably pursuing in some way or another some form of popularity. Uh, you want to you want to be liked, and so maybe you're here this morning, and you, you know you're kind of about that image management. You want everything to look right and to be right, all right? You want our family to look the right way from the outside. Look at the way we dress. Look at our house. Look at our yard. Look at our car. Look at the way that we walk into church. Oh, we look good. Kids, don't tell them I cussed at you on the way to church this morning. For some, it could just be a whim. This last week, you're just blown like the wind. Well, it's just blowing this way, blowing that way. You, you're not pursuing, pursuing anything and everything. Right? The, the whim for you might have been money. It might be all of a sudden you wanted a bigger house. It might mean that your kid is a student of the year. It might mean that 
your kid is dumb, so he beats up the student of the year. Amen? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. not talking about your child. If you're like most people in our culture today, and being really honest, the last seven days you are probably pursuing and hungering and thirsting for something other than righteousness and God. Uh, we're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Some of us need to change our appetites. I don't know how this, this is an tr absolutely true story. It was, several years ago, we were in Middle Tennessee, and somehow or another, I became addicted to Diet Cokes. I don't know how it happened. One day I drank one, and I was like, zero calories. I don't know how it happened. I would drink a Diet Coke every once in a while. Next thing you know, I, was, I never, I've never, up to this point, I did not drink coffee or anything like that. So I'd drink a Diet Coke in the morning, kind of get the caffeine going. And then I, I'd drink, drink one at the office. I'd take a lunch break. I'd drink another Diet Coke. Then I'd carry one with me back to the office. And then I would, you know, I'd just keep doing that. And next thing you know, I don't have no idea how many hours drinking a day, but I was drinking a lot of Diet Cokes every single day. And then one holiday weekend, my in-laws came over. You can look at them. They're over here. Y'all can look at them. Well, we're not coming back. Good! I'm kidding. Y'all know I'm kidding. They know. Y'all know. We all know I'm kidding. And so what happened was this. My father-in-law gets over there, and he's like grumbling because I don't drink coffee. We don't drink coffee. We never drink coffee. I'll tell you what kind of people is this? You live in life, don't drink coffee. I ain't got no coffee in the house. I'm supposed to come visit you. Was, Merry Christmas, my rear end. <laughs> and I said, listen, old man, let's go. Come on. I put them in the truck, we went to the Dollar General, bought a real, really cheap coffee maker and like some like Folgers in a can and like we came back and he made coffee and here's how he makes coffee, I don't know about, he takes like this much coffee ground, this much and he dumps it in the thing and then one more pinch and then he puts three drops of water and cuts the machine on and then there's some stuff in the bottom of it. And then he's like, hey, I'm about to pour you some coffee. He grabbed the coffee mug, and it doesn't pour, it plops. Plop, plop, plop. And then I was like, man, that's gross. He goes, no, this is good. He grabbed one of them little, uh, uh, one of those bear honey containers, you know, the, the honey comes in a little bear, and he's like, Psst. drink that, you'll love it. I drank it, I could feel the hair growing on my head. It was the most disgusting thing I'd ever put in my mouth. But eventually, you know, I worked on, I worked on the coffee, and I kind of got it to where I like it. And what I did was I completely quit drinking Diet Cokes. I drank a couple of cups of coffee in the morning the way I like it, which is not the way he likes it. And uh, so I completely changed my appetite for that. I, I enjoy my coffee now where I didn't before. But then several, maybe even a year later, I hadn't had a Diet Coke. Some occasion comes up, and there's a Diet Coke to drink, so I drink it. I drink that Diet Coke. I honestly think it's the most disgusting drink on the planet Earth. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't taste right. It doesn't taste real. It's just weird. And, I, and what had happened? My appetite for those Diet Cokes had completely changed. Right? Why aren't we hungry and thirsting for righteousness? It's because we need to change our appetites. If you start pursuing God, you start trusting God, you start leaning into God, and you're trusting Him, being led by the Spirit, empowered by His presence, suddenly you'll be uh, long for more of Him. You're hungering and thirsting for righteousness when before you had a different appetite. And you're hungering and thirsting for other things. Does that make sense? So why don't we see more of this in our home? Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I'm going to give you a couple of things this morning that absolutely do not work. Take some notes, write this down. Number one, legalism. Legalism does not work in the home. Uh, what is legalistic Christianity? We reduce Christianity in our homes to a bunch of do's and don'ts, can's and can'ts, should and shouldn'ts, ought and ought not. I'm not talking about not having rules in the home, but not letting your rules to rule over you. And this is the one, and this is where I'm really, I'm really guilty of this one. Really guilty of that. And because what happens is the, the breaking the rule becomes the thing, but the heart of the child breaking the rule is the thing, isn't it? Look at this next slide. Josh McDowell, he said this. He said, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Write that down. Rules without relationship always leads to rebellion. 
Have you ever seen that in the life of somebody? When our attitude is, well, let's perform, let's good, do good, be good, act good, let's keep the rules, let's put on our best image for church. It's only rules, 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 rules without relationship. It always leads to rebellion. Look at this next slide. Legalism doesn't work in religion, and it will not work at home. Right? Number two, write this down. Second thing that doesn't work at home is hypocrisy. Ouch. Maybe you want to call it being lukewarm, a lukewarm Christian. You don't take your faith seriously. Right? You come to church, you sing the songs, you amen the preacher, then you go home, you live like a pagan. Hypocrisy. Christian in name only. We, listen, a lukewarm, hypocritical Christian is a Christian that believes in God and then lives like he doesn't exist. Believes in God, but then lives as if he's not even real. Christian in name only. No real passion for the things that bring glory to God. Listen, how do you know if you're in a hypocritical or a lukewarm Christian family? I, mean, I don't know, but you do. You know if you're in one. Now, I'll give you a couple of questions, a little self-examination, uh, to find out if you're in maybe a lukewarm, possibly hypocritical Christian family. Uh, do you ever pray together as a family? Even over a meal? I mean, ever. Maybe, if we're not doing that at all, maybe I'm slipping into being lukewarm. Do you ever talk about spiritual things in your family? Do things come up? Well, hey, I read this in my Bible or this. Hey, I've been praying about this and look what God did. Look how God showed up. You know, those kind of things. If not, you're probably drifting into hypocrisy. I mean, if you've got children and you've never, ever said this, hey, kids, I don't think we should be watching this. That guy has used God's name in vain 20 times in 30 seconds. Maybe we need to find something else to watch. If you've never had that conversation in 2018, you might be slipping into hypocrisy and being a lukewarm Christian. Maybe it's like, hey, guys, you know these friends we have? We love them. We're going to keep loving them. But the way they act, the way they live, and the things they want to do don't exactly match up with our values. So we're going to keep loving them, but we're not going to live like them. Right? If those conversations and things never happen, maybe slipping into a hypocritical, lukewarm form of Christianity. And honestly, legalism and hypocrisy never have worked. Look at Revelation 3.16. This is what Jesus said about being lukewarm. It says, then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Uh, that word vomit in the Greek means vomit. <laughs> There's your theology lesson. So what do we do? That doesn't work. Legalism, hypocrisy doesn't work. What does work? Write this down. Jesus in the middle. Write it. Jesus, Jesus in the middle of what? Everything. Jesus in the middle. Why don't we just, uh, we don't want to just be a Christian family name only. Uh, we want to have Jesus in the middle of everything. Unfortunately, you know, around 80% of our country at any given time are saying, yeah, 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 I'm a Christian, yeah, 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 we're all Christians, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, right? And, but what we want to say as a family, if we're not being hypocritical, if we're not being legalistic either, what we want to be able to say as a family, no, 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 it's not like we're just Christian in name only. Jesus is the center of our lives. Our home is characterized by the fact that Jesus is in the middle of it at all times. Scripture doesn't say, blessed are those who believe in Christ when it's convenient. Right? It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If, if we don't, we need to change our appetites. I love the way David put it. Look in your notes at Psalm 63 and verse 1. He said, oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no Water. I mean, let's like, just check out that language. There's nothing in there about like, yeah, when it's convenient. Right? It's just every bit of me wants you. I want you. Imagine the silly things that we uh, put in the place of God. Oh, popularity, you're my God. In a dry and thirsty land, I search for you. Oh, success, you are my God. In a dry and weary land, I search for you. Right? Oh, money, you are my... It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But yet our lives kind of show that that's what we're actually doing. 
What do we need to do? Write this down. We need to help your family see who God really is. Who He really is. That He loves you. That He's approachable. Listen, and dads, especially dads, I want you to hear me, especially if you have daughters, you need to understand the research really bears this out. How your daughter views her relationship with her dad will have a huge impact on how she views her relationship with her Heavenly Father. There's a, I know, it's too much, isn't it? That's a lot of pressure. It's a fact, right? And so if you have a legalistic, mean-spirited relationship with your daughter, guess what? She's going to think she's serving a legalistic, mean-spirited God. Right? There, there's a lot of research out there. I won't go into it. But in many ways, how your children view their relationship with their father is a direct correlation to how they view their relationship with their heavenly father. You need to help your family see who God really is, that he loves you. He's approachable. You can go to him for anything and everything. You can approach the throne of grace with boldness, and he's involved in everything that we do. You want to create an environment in your home uh, where your kids won't talk about God. Not that they have to, but they want to. So how do you do it? Right? You're like, oh man, that's a lot. Thanks. I don't even know where to start. Listen, I, I'm going to give you three very practical ways to do it. These aren't even original. Okay, how can you do this? How do you create a hunger and thirst for the things of God in your family? Number one, A, write this down. Include Jesus in your daily talks. Jesus needs to become part of your conversation in life. Never talk about God. Never mention God in your family. There's something wrong with that. And so if you don't, it may seem weird. It seems like you're forcing something in. What do I mean by including Jesus in your daily talks? You're driving down the road with your family and the sun is setting and it's awesome and it's beautiful. And instead of saying, dude, that's an awesome sunset. Right? You say, dude, that's an awesome sunset that God has blessed us with. Include Jesus in how you talk. Right? Isn't God being good to us? Look at this. Did you see this? God, just, just bring him into the conversation. Even with your wife, if you're trying to make a decision and you're like, well, I don't know if we should do this or not. You know, here's the pros, here's the cons. What do you, you know, hey, what do you think God wants us to do? Hey, let's pray about it. Inject God into your daily conversations, even if you have to fake it. Fake it till you make it. Inject God into your daily conversations. And you're just reminding yourself that we're not just a Christian family and name only, but we want Jesus in the middle of everything. I mean, for years I've told my kids, I mean, I do it all the time, right? You can ask them after the service. And if I didn't, they'd probably lie for me because we raised a couple of pagans. But listen to me. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Y'all know I'm kidding. Y'all know I'm kidding. Can't tell a joke these days. I would tell, uh, all, all the time, I would say, man, God blessed us. That, man, God really looked. For example, one time my truck, the tires on my truck were just slick. I mean, like racing slicks. You know what I mean? And I knew I needed to get new tires, but I didn't want to. Why? Because I'm cheap. And tires are expensive, aren't they? I mean, it's like, what? Do I have to take a mortgage out to pay for my tires on my truck? And so I'm procrastinating, procrastinating, putting it off. And I'm like, oh, I need to put tires on the truck. And I know I just need to go and do it and make it happen and spend the money, but I didn't want to. I got more miles on these bad boys. Finally, I was going to meet some precious people at the hospital that needed prayer. And I go out of my door at the carport, and I can see right there in the back of my bald, bald tire, I could see a screw as, as if somebody just come up and said, zoop, just screw to screw into that tire. And I thought, goodness, I can make it. <laughs> then I said, no. And I was in a hurry. So when I just jumped in, I stopped at a tire shop uh, and to get them to fix that. And I know how bad those tires look, but I'm still being Mr. Cheapskate over here. And so I'm like, yeah, I got to unscrew. And I said, hey, my, my tires are in bad shape. Can you go ahead and give me a price on them? I'd already priced around I knew what they were going to cost yeah yeah I was just embarrassed they look terrible and so they're working on it he comes to price and he goes uh. anyway long story short uh, he come and gave me a deal I could not pass up on some really great tires right and I was just like hey wow that's a lot less than I was expecting to pay let's do this and they put the new tires on the truck and I was just like that's awesome isn't God good and then two days later the snow apocalypse happened <laughs> right and if I hadn't, I hadn't changed my tires that day, I'd been trying to get around on slicks, right? Even four drives, just been on slicks, okay? And so that's what I was saying. And then, but who did I give credit for that to? 
You can ask, man, God just worked that out, didn't he? He knew how stupid I was and how, how procrastinating and cheap I am. And God just gave me a deal I couldn't refuse to put tires on my truck so I can move my family around safely. Isn't God good? We need to put Jesus in the middle of our life and our daily conversations and how we talk. Which do you think is a happier home? The home that says, man, isn't God good how he blessed us with those tires right on time? Or the home that says, I can't believe how much those stupid tires cost. Which home do you think is a happier home? Which home do you want your home to be? Put Jesus in the middle of your conversations. And remember, uh, just God has blessed you. So, A, we include Jesus in our daily talks. And if you want to hunger and thirst for righteousness, B, write this down. Make a decision. We go to church. And I don't just mean this Sunday. I mean every Sunday. You only have to make that decision once. One time. We go to church. We're a family that goes to church. One time and you never have to make that decision again. If you're a Jesus-centered home, guess what you do? You make a priority out of worship. Some things are non-negotiable. Listen, a minimum, 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 absolute minimum that we could give God is one hour a week. One the creator, the sustainer, he sent his son to Jesus to die on the cross and, and we can come and hear the proclamation of his word because faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. You say to your family, we go to church. You can make it happen. Everybody else did. It's part of who we are. We're part of the fellowship of believers. We make it a priority. Listen, you make it part of your family culture. We go to church. We don't miss engaging with other believers and ministering to other people. We go to church. I can still remember when me and Alicia decided. We go to church. We've been going to church three times a week, minimum, ever since. Even when it's Super Bowl Sunday. But listen to me. And people used to call because we were like, wake up every morning. I know I've told this before. Wake up every morning, uh, every Sunday morning and kind of be like, oh, man, you know, am I sick? Do I have an excuse to stay home? No, I don't think I'm sick. And then Alicia would roll over and grunt just a little. She'd be like, oh, I bet, baby, are you okay? Are you sick? She's like, yeah, I think, are you sure? I mean, if you don't fill up your church today, that's okay. We can stay home. Right? I mean, literally, if she grunted on Monday, I'd say, suck it up, buttercup. But on Sunday, I was there. My precious bride. Right? But then we made that decision. We go to church. And we never had to make it again. That phone used to ring on Sundays. Eventually, it quit ringing. We'd come home, check our messages. We'd have two or three missed calls when we came back from church. And eventually those calls just stopped because everybody knew when it come time to call the Kellys, they ain't there, they're at church. Make it a priority. So we include Jesus in our talks. We make a decision. We go to church and see, number three, see, demonstrate the joy of serving and seeking God. It's fun. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, just, it's fun. Why are you so upset? Why are you so grouchy? Jesus loves you. <laughs> And I'm trying. Isn't that the expression, right? Jesus loves you and I'm trying. Right? Demonstrate the joy of serving and seeking God. Let's, uh, parents, if you like, and you can do this in your home, in your family, really practical ways. Uh, you can have fun with your kids. Read scripture together with your kids. You know, our, our, our children's ministry team on Wednesday night, they do an amazing job with our kids. So if you're not bringing your kids on Wednesday night, you're just missing out. And one of the things that they have for our kids are these uh, make it stick Things like, and you can always go on the, if you, your children are involved in ministry here, go to Grace, get on Facebook, go to the Grace Baptist Children's Department Facebook page and join it. And this is one of the things that you'll always see is this make it stick. And this is just a practical, handy something to put in your hand to give you ideas how to make uh, doing life with Jesus in the middle fun with your kids. It always has different things that you can do. I just in the car, hanging out, at dinner, and all those things. And oftentimes it has some little game to play, some little idea. One of the things I heard recently, if you've got small children, you need to do this or you just don't love the Lord. Amen. I'm kidding. Uh, but listen, uh, take some popcorn. Put it in the middle of the floor. Get down on the floor with your kids, right? And we're going to have prayer time. We, eat, we take prayer requests. We eat popcorn. 
All right, then we're going to take turns praying around. And when you're praying, you're allowed to sneak popcorn once. And then when you're done, we finish the popcorn. And when we're done praying, we finish the popcorn. Well, a kid wouldn't want to do that. All right? Your little children would love that. Listen, show them that it's fun and joyful to serve the Lord. Get off the lemon sucking committee and show that there's fun and joy in serving the Lord. Listen, if, if I said get off the lemon sucking committee and that offended you, that means you're on it. Is he talking about me? Yes! Listen, raise your hand. A little survey time. Who thinks it'd be a good idea for children to read the Bible? Everybody. Listen, if you want your children to read the Bible, you need to read the Bible. You want your children to have a quiet time? Mom, you better have a quiet time. Dad, you better have a quiet time. I mean, listen, if you do it and it's part of your family culture, you probably won't even have to ask them to do it. They'll just start doing it automatically because they've seen you doing it. It's just what we do as a family. When you decide we're going to church, guess what? They won't ask on Saturday night, are we going to church tomorrow? They'll know we go to church. When they get up in the morning, they won't ask, should I read the Bible? They'll know that we read the Bible. It's just what we do. Here's the thing. I heard a preacher say this. I, saw, I thought this was so good. I wanted to share it with you guys. Look at this next slide. We don't have to tell our children to be good when we're already seeking the one who is good. When we're already, seeing, we're already pointing their hearts towards the one that is good. I don't mean that the kids are going to be perfect, stay out of trouble, or any of those things, but we don't have to tell them to be good when we're already pointing them to the only one who really is good. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Again, our verse this morning, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Look at it. Say it with me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Listen, it might sound crazy, but if you demonstrate the joy of seeking and serving God, you probably won't have to tell your teenagers, don't have sex, don't drink, don't do drugs. Some kids run after the party crowd because that's the only group of people in their life that looks like they're having fun. Men, let me tell you this. Men, listen, look at me. If your wife has to drag your tail to church on Sunday morning, someday it's very likely that you're going to drag your children out of, jail, out of jail one Monday morning. Demonstrate the joy. You can have what God wants you to have if you pursue God, period. Or you can have what the world wants you to settle for, which is what everybody has. And we already pointed out that's the struggle bus. Stress, struggle. You can have what the world wants you to settle for and end up with those results, but if you want something different, you're going to have to do something different. And if you don't do anything different, you're just going to end up with the same results. Man, it's time for you to get up off your backside and lead your family. And again, you're like, well, I don't even know where to start. I just told you. Let's begin to interject Jesus in your daily conversations. Make church a priority in your life. And show by your actions that it's a blessing to love and serve Jesus. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a decision. It's a decision. It's a decision. Sure, some people just get lucky and have good kids. All right? I don't know how we overcame Alicia's genes in our family pool. <laughs> they have such good kids. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, sometimes it's just luck of the draw. You know, you know what I mean? You know a family, they got good kids. The oldest one is just a sweetheart, it's just lovely. And the second one is just as wonderful, if not a little better. And then the third one is like a little demon, right? And like, did they just quit parenting at this point? Listen, I'm not promising you magical, you know, results. Some children have different bents and personalities than others. But I'm telling you that if you begin to include Jesus in your daily conversations, right, you make church a priority and you show that it's a joy and a blessing to serve God in your life and you choose to do it. Look at this verse, Joshua 24, 15. I love this verse. It's my favorite verse in all of the Bible. Matter of fact, in my office right now, I have this verse on the wall from a Bible that was printed in the 1500s. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day. When? 
Whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You choose, you choose, you choose, you choose, you choose. If you're going to be an absentee, absentee pagan parent, you chose it. When your children grow up to be absentee pagan kids, you, you chose it for them. You choose. Are you going to be a Christian in name only? Or is Jesus really going to be the middle of everything that you do? Are you going to place Jesus in his, the priority that he deserves? You make a choice. Why? Because it says, blessed are those who? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Let me tell you this. The opposite. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Cursed are those who do not hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be empty. Empty. It's a choice. And you can choose. And when can you choose it? Choose it today. Today. Why do, I don't care what you did last night. I don't care what you did this morning on the way to church. I don't care what you did last week. I don't care what you did last year. Today you can choose. Men, you can say today. As for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. It's a choice. Ain't God good? Let's pray. Father, we just pray that your spirit would just lovingly convict our hearts, that we won't just blend in with the world, God, but we'll have Jesus in the middle of our lives in a very real way. Lord, forgive us for when we live as if you don't exist. We know that you do. God, help us not to be legalistic in our relationships. Lord, help us to not be lukewarm hypocrites. Father, help us to be on fire, Jesus-centered, seeking you and your righteousness above everything else. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Listen, as we continue to pray this morning, there are some of you here you know. We keep talking about blessed are the righteous, the righteous, the righteous, and you know that you're not righteous. You're like, man, I'm in trouble. I'm unrighteous. And you know it. And I got good news for you. I'm not righteous either. Nobody here is. None of us are righteous in of our, ourselves. The good news is, is that you're not made in a right relationship with God based upon your righteousness. That only happens through faith in Jesus, the perfect, sinless Son of God. Look up here. Look at this verse. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. By faith our sins are forgiven. That's it. By faith you can be made righteous. And when your sins are forgiven and God makes you righteous, He'll come and live in you and empower you and strengthen you to live a life that's pleasing to Him. But without Jesus, it's impossible. You can't do it. I can't do it. Nobody can do it. And there are those of you here this morning, right now, you hear me, you see me, and you know that God is calling you to a life of righteousness, to step away from your sin and to trust Him as Lord and Savior. That's why God brought you here this morning. That's how good He is. He brought you here for this moment so that you can trust Him. Again, the Bible says, choose this day who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, maybe you're like, I'm just a kid. I'm a teenager. I'm a, you know, I don't have a house. As for you and the little 48-inch square that you stand on, where my feet stand, I will serve the Lord. You need to trust Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Jesus can never be the middle of something he's not a part of. Trust him. Let's pray again. Those of you that, you know, this morning you just... You know that you want to call on Jesus. You know you need to be saved. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No looking around. Those of you just write, I want to be saved. I call on Jesus. I want him to forgive me of my sins. Slip your hand up all over the sanctuary. God bless you. I see you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Choose this day right now. Who else? Let me see it. God bless you. Maybe you need to pray a prayer like this. Just admit that you're a sinner. Say, God, I'm a sinner. 
Just humble yourself. Be sincere to God. Say, God, I'm a sinner. I do dirt. I do it on purpose, but I want you to forgive me. I want to turn from my sin, and I want to turn to Jesus. I want to put Jesus in the middle of my life. Tell him, say, God, I've been in the middle, and it hasn't worked. But I'm trusting you to save me. I'm asking you to save me. Tell him. He'll save you. Tell him, say, Father, I'm trusting in, in, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for my salvation. Nothing else. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Tell him, Lord, I believe. Call on him.